Okay, welcome back to the Investigative Journal on this December 14th, 2015 day on our calendar. I'm your host, Greg Anthony, and you're listening to FirstAmendmentRadio.com. You can catch my show, if you so choose, every evening from 6 p.m. to 7 p.m. That's Pacific Time on FirstAmendmentRadio.com. Now, now, my guest today takes us way, way back. We're going to go back 10 years, and uh, I was the first radio broadcaster to bring Leo Zagami from Rome onto my radio station to talk about the New World Order, the Illuminati, because he was actually an insider and had many, many Vatican connections as a young man, as a uh, DJ. And from there, his story is so interesting that I spent many, many hours with Leo learning a lot of things about what was going on in the Vatican, what the Illuminati was all about, and I provided information to Americans back then that they really hadn't done, hadn't heard before. And it's led so many different places over the 10 years, and both Leo and I have crossed paths a few times during that 10 years, but it's been a, a while since Leo's been on my show, and since then, he's published a lot of books, done a lot of things that you'd probably be interested in, and he's now in Rome, again, working on another book, and so without any uh, further intro, Leo Zagami wants to come back on and talk to us about <laughs> what he's been doing the last 10 years. Leo, tell us a little bit. Well, yeah, I mean, uh, we left each other uh, that we were talking about certain things, and those things really manifested in front of our eyes and uh, changed the life uh, of many people and at the same time uh, uh, we have uh, really been uh, uh, testimony to uh, uh, what is an epochal change, something uh, uh, that is apocalyptic now, becoming really visible to everybody. But 10 years ago it wasn't so visible, Greg. I mean, uh, you remember how skeptic everybody was when we, we were talking about the Vatican. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, skepticism everywhere. Um, things have changed. Finally, and you know something, Leo, too, they've changed also in myself as back 10 years ago, I didn't quite understand it as I do today. And there are certain things that happened in our lives that, oh boy, I'll tell you, there were so many people coming at me doing these things, saying these things, that sure. we see changes in ourselves too. And I think the progression in 10 years of sticking with this story, as you have, has given us a better, uh, uh, a better idea of how to live with this, correct? And how to yes, function. And I mean, since we last spoke, uh, I got back into the story, basically, because uh, when you are in Rome, of course, it was the Romans, and uh, <laughs> you, you become uh, involved again in the whole show, and then I ended up, uh, like a week ago, back in the newspapers, uh, involved with Patty Leaks, uh, because uh, of my cameraman, the, these crowds that uh, have been arrested in the Vatican were trying to intercepting and hacking inside their computers that are used for Illuminati news, and uh, the police arrived and picked up. I mean, it became a big thing, and it ended up in the newspapers. Um, but, uh, of course, uh, since then I've also been in the newspapers for other things here in Italy, involved with politics. Uh, I was uh, in an electoral campaign for uh, running for government with Berlusconi. I was then uh, unsatisfied and uh, led this Forks Revolution. I mean, a lot of things have happened, definitely, and so they enrich the story this uh, conspiracy reality, because it's not a conspiracy theory anymore, it's something different, which uh, we have, we, we are basically being, uh, uh, we are reporting history, Greg, and uh, I, it was really hard for me the week before my father died, I remember it was 2010, he died back uh, 10th of March 2010, and I remember a week before we were talking about this the situation with the radio show, with what I had said about certain things that was quite harsh. Mm -hmm. And at the time, you know, even my father was saying, maybe you exaggerated a bit, but uh, I said, no, I didn't exaggerate. This is the fact that the time will prove me right, and time has proven me completely right, uh, to the point that every single person mentioned, uh, also in my books, but before with your interviews, with all the work we did uh, of investigative journalism, the conferences, uh, the, 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 the work that basically went uh, un, unseen for a while because people were not ready to 
really grasp the truth. Then the truth, uh, uh, unfortunately, was exposed, but it's exposed by facts, by proven facts, by scandals, by people arrested, by more and more pedophiles in the Catholic Church, by more and more corruption in the Vatican Bank, by uh, Masonic infiltration, Opus Dei, uh, the Illuminati, of course, there is also the involvement of the Academy of the Illuminati in all this, and my own Illuminati order, and, and, and then we have this uh, pink pope, Tarcisio Bertone, who uh, then was finally exposed with his penthouse, which uh, I also mentioned in my book, this luxurious penthouse. He, who was the secretary, the cardinal secretary of state, and still detains the power because he has, uh, for one year, intercepted everybody going in and out of the Vatican one year before he left. So now he knows all the prostitutes, all the drugs, everything that goes in the Vatican, where it goes, and he can blackmail everybody. People don't know this but now they're starting to realize that it's the truth when you know exactly these things come out and if I could if I could just say something when uh, when I first found when we first talked ten years ago one of the things I remember speaking with you about we were all I, you were mentioning names of Pete you were an Illuminati insider one who worked in the Vatican one who, and and decided to get out and then you started reeling off names and things this is when I didn't know you and it all started to make sense to me and the reason I brought you on the show is I lived there for seven years in the 80s was there during the Vatican Bank scandal when P2 Lodge was uncovered and all the bishops were involved in it and all these names the Italian guys that you were telling me about I said you know this guy knows what he's talking about and I want to talk reaching Marcinkus before he was uh, about to die exactly he was trying to interview him and that's when the Italian journalists were here, and they wanted to interview him, and then 10 days later, he's dead. <laughs> uh, very, very that's interesting. A, that's a story that this well, you know, one of the me. interesting stories, and you know Marcinkus, the head of the Vatican Bank back then, right? When yeah. I was doing that story from here, talking about uh, how the Italians are going to open up the murder charge against Calvi and bring it, bring it involved with uh, Marcinkus here, who was in a... In a, in a Catholic church in Phoenix where they airlifted him, the American military brought him out of Rome during that scandal. You remember that. Well, anyway, I got contacted by his godson. And his godson was a very intelligent man, and he started telling me, Greg, he says, you shouldn't realize that Father Marchinkas was a patsy. And, you're, you know, you ought to really understand that. And nobody's going to like, like you. Nobody's going to believe you about the Vatican. And why don't you just become a really nice entertainer? You have a great voice. So he's trying to tell me to lay off the story, right? Yeah, and so yeah, I said, right away. and so you know what I said to him? I said, Arthur, uh, you know what? Why don't we do this? Why don't we get an interview with, Marche with your God's father? And we'll go to Phoenix and I will tape everything, but I won't print. I won't do anything. I'll clear his name. I won't say anything till after he passes away. And he said, well, he's an old man, but he listens to your shows, I know. I know he does that because we talk about it. And maybe he wants to do it. Well, 10 days later, he was dead, you know. So yeah, go figure. Yeah, that, that was a very bad thing uh, that obviously led to the fact that nobody after his death uh, uh, is able now to trace all those secrets which died really with him, you know. Yeah, because uh, Calvi's son wanted to get to the truth, right? Well, of course, and, and then now, in, in the modern situation of the Vatican with Pope Francis, we have instead not, uh, the news of today, which is Manival is now uh, starting to evaluate the possibility of giving their blessing to the Vatican Bank. Of course, uh, there is being a uh, clearance of all their uh, dark secrets that started uh, just when Ratzinger was about to resign and then went on into Pope Francis' nomination. In that period of time, as you remember, even mm -hmm. the, the, the cash machines of the Vatican were blocked, and so there was a whole scene there in which uh, there was really uh, somebody from on top uh, uh, leading, you know, the strings because the gold in the Vatican got brought out of the Vatican and uh, uh, brought to the JP Morgan in Frankfurt and uh, all this uh, uh, because it was, of course, a lot of it was also Nazi gold that the Vatican recycled with uh, their own uh, logo 
uh, their own symbol. But uh, I mean, this is a big scandal, and now we are starting to see the first, I mean, investigations in Italy into uh, this Banco del Fusino, and there is involved the Prince Torlonia, which is from the black nobility. There is uh, involved the people um, on top of the crowds that now gave out this information that supposedly led the Vatican to be worried, but they're not really worried. I mean, even the, the crowds themselves, you know, the supposed crowds, uh, Francesca Ciocchi and, and Bald, these, uh, these two uh, people who got arrested by the Vatican, they, 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 they said that they didn't really publish the serious stuff. They just published some stuff, enough to compromise uh, at the Vatican, I would say yes, but uh, you know, Pope Francis is playing the Jesuit role of being a great actor. Back in those days, we, we used to broadcast a large part of our uh, work was dedicated, if you remember, in exposing the Jesuits <laughs> because right. they are, uh, and they are even more now that they have a Pope, uh, the, the, the real key to understand everything in the Vatican. Well, um, let me ask this before we, you know, we, we got about 15 minutes here in this first half hour. You, your last book was entitled uh, Pope Francis, The Last Pope. Now, why do you, why do you, what uh, argument do you make that this will be the last pope and why? Why from your point of view? There is a series of uh, prophecies, apocalyptic writings. Even ISIS uh, lately in an inter they intercepted this terrorist that was arrested between Italy and Kosovo uh, a week ago. Uh, and they were saying uh, between each other, this is the last pope. This is the last pope. It's like a mantra, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and in, uh, in the prophecies of Malachi, we have Petrus Romanus. This Petrus Romanus was supposed to be, in a way, Tarcisio Bertone, who comes from Sano Romano, and even Grillo said it was him who was Petrus Romanus, but then he got so involved into the, the, the bribe, the scandals, the, 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 all this uh, uh, gay lobby that surrounds him, uh, that uh, of course uh, he didn't manage to maintain his position as uh, Pope, and uh, the Jesuits uh, uh, kind of blackmailed Ratzinger, uh, not kind, actually they blackmailed Ratzinger, there is evidence of this, because the second of Cardinal, you remember Cardinal Maria Martini, he right. was very big even at your time, you know, when you were in Rome. Cardinal Mart uh, he, he was a Jesuit and before he died, uh, he uh, said to Ratzinger during the meeting of the families in Milan, it's your time to resign. The secretary of Cardinal Martini, before dying himself, the year later, uh, he uh, left testament uh, deposited uh, to the journalist uh, where he stated uh, this thing. So it's not uh, a conspiracy theory; it's fact. Why do they want? Why did they want him out? <clears throat> they want Ratzinger out because. Uh, you see, uh, the, uh, the, you, we know very well the history of the Jesuits. They were kicked out. They came back in gradually to gain more and more power until in this moment of time they can step in and take the whole show because they are the secret service of the Vatican they have all the information about everybody and of course the, the, the decline of the church is at this point so visible that they were calling as like an emergency you know it's, it's, I always equiparate in, in my book of Francis the last pope I uh, say this that I there is a kind of if you relate, for example, Putin, when he was called Vladimir Putin by Boris Yeltsin to save Russia in a situation, I was there in Russia in those days, and it was very turbulent times in Russia, uh, to change things, and the same thing, and he was an ex head of the chief of the KGB, KGB, and the same thing is done with the Jesuits stepping in suddenly into the position of power in the Vatican, even if there is actually a living Pope that yesterday came to the opening of this door in this very awkward situation with two Popes. Uh, but uh, still Ratzinger retains uh, a lot of the conservative power and also uh, control with the gay lobby. The gay lobby is very powerful. Uh, you remember your mm -hmm. days, uh, famous Monsignor Camaldo. You mm -hmm. remember he was quite famous in the, in the 80s in the CA environment in Rome. Um, he's uh, known also, but uh, uh, published uh, his code name, which was Jessica. Uh, very known into the gay circles and also used by the CA for various things. So uh, there is this gay lobby that now is very strong 
um, Cardinal Albertone bought this palace, this building. We went with, uh, you know, with Alex Jones this summer. We did this special uh, in Rome. Very risky to do this kind of thing. We did it. We had to really do it very fast without being detected. If we did the same thing now, it would be impossible because Rome is being militarized. You see, ISIS is uh, really wanting to strike Rome. Rome is their, uh, you know, the, really the start of visible start of the apocalypse, and they have their own apocalyptic uh, writings, different, of course, from us. Uh, they say that they work for the Antichrist, but they say that at one point, this is Islamic, of course, belief, that at one point after they destroy Rome, the uh, real Messiah will come in front of the Dajjal, in front of the Antichrist, in front of these forces that have destroyed Rome, and will actually side with them. So this is the crazy thing that people don't want to understand about ISIS that, of course, is being created by uh, the, the, the America, the CIA, the Mossad, and the whole show, the certain lodges uh, of the military-industrial complex. But uh, the thing is here that they don't understand that the belief is um, a very apocalyptic belief in which they think that Jesus <laughs> will turn out Muslim at the end of times and basically uh, this conquering Rome is all part of this show. Uh, the Jesuits have sided visibly with uh, the Muslims. You remember that? We mm -hmm. talked about this a long yeah. time ago. And I think that the problem actually manifested after with the election of Pope Francis that is visibly bringing in Chris Lam. So And uh, the Jesuits have to be behind uh, the thinking of ISIS and the creation of this using the American military, etc. You want a name? I give you a name of a Jesuit who is there training them and in their... Uh, yeah, go ahead. Well, uh, uh, two or three years ago, uh, they kidnapped officially a Jesuit in Syria called Padre D'Alloyo. Okay. Padre Go ahead. I love you. It was never found again. I initially, was given for dead by the Vatican, by everybody. And instead, then now, it's alive. But uh, he is uh, with ISIS. And so you think so, he's, he's there exactly helping organize this whole thing? Because isn't it amazing was, how... He was, I tell you, he <laughs> was, because I have the evidence, he was working with the CIA to train anti-Assad forces. Those forces join ISIS. He is with ISIS. Mm -hmm. And uh, here we go, because it's amazing how well organized they are, and all of their equipment seems to be Western or Russian uh, military equipment, correct? And most of the equipment is actually uh, U.S. Uh, and uh, Israeli, because uh, there was, uh, uh, you know, an anti-Assad program uh, where, uh, you know, we actually give the, uh, you know, like you, the U.S. actually gave the weapons and even until a month ago, they were parachuting weapons to ISIS. They showed the mm -hmm. photos in Italian newspapers, not, not in the American ones. Mm -hmm. So they said that they did that by mistake. Well, I mean, what is a mistake to throw a bunch of machine guns and stuff to ISIS? I mean, you must be demented. <laughs> so, so we know that's not the case because they are called intelligence. And so um, the thing is that we are in front of uh, a trained force, which uh, I will remind also most people go there on the news and debate and, and talk rubbish, that they actually have uh, the military forces also of Saddam in a way that actually it is a, this is an army, it's not a terrorist organization. Uh, and people, if they think they can defeat ISIS, even if it is constructed by the West, and you want to defeat it in any way, even the Russians, you know, they will end up like Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. So the problem here is, personally, myself, I see it this way, that the only way we can actually deactivate this huge problem, which is the radicalism uh, piloted, of course, by the Muslim, by the mind controllers, by the manipulators, those people who I describe in volume one of my confessions, where I talk about the Jesuit university where they train CIA students. And I actually show the place, I show where it is in my book, volume one. And, uh, and, and, and so I really, uh, prove these connections. But now the only way to deactivate should, it would be to actually go into a table, a diplomatic table of discussion made of true people, generals, not politicians who are just puppets, 
and talk with the Pars, all the Muslim Pars, including even al-Baghdadi himself, because at that point, you put the Muslims in front of one of their own. This guy is like this, okay, we put him in a council in front of the other Muslims, and we see how the other Muslims react. Mm -hmm. If they don't condemn him, then they are in league with him. The thing that they don't want to admit to the Muslims is that they have this idea of caliphate in the Sunni belief uh, already a long time. Uh, it's been going on forever. And uh, in the other part, the Shiite belief is no better because they also are pushing towards the end of times. Ali Akcha, you remember? You right. were there when Ali Akcha tried to kill the Pope. He wrote a book that was not published in the English language, but was published in Italian. And he came to the Vatican. I interviewed more than once also the brother of Emanuele Orlandi. Uh, you can go on the internet and you can go on YouTube and see the interviews, unfortunately, only in Italian, of me and Pietro Orlandi, the brother. And you know what happened with Emanuele Orlandi. It was a big thing, no, mm -hmm. at the time. And uh, all of this was interconnected. The, 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 the attempted uh, murder uh, organized within the Jesuit and intelligence services uh, um, to compromise the East uh, even more, you know, the Russians uh, going with all, the, all that Bulgarian tale, which was all a farce. Um, and of course, Ali Akcha now wrote a book in which he writes also of the prophetic beliefs of these fundamentalist Shiites. The way that they believe that the Vatican will actually be destroyed um, on a specific date that coincides with the revelation of the first secret of Fatima. And this will be 2017, I think in May 2017. Uh, this is not a Sunni, but a Shia. So as you see, there is uh, really um, Islam functions, and you know that I have lived Islam from within, uh, functions instrumentally very well for this new world order setup in which they, of course, manipulate the different religions, everything, but in the end, uh, when they are together in the United Nations, they're all one with the other, the same, in, uh, in wanting to feed of this uh, kind of New Age creed that is about to uh, impose, you know, on this world uh, even uh, a scenario which is unprecedented in the next few years because of Agenda 2030, which is being implemented right now in Paris. So the situation is really on the go and very exciting under a journalistic or at least for me as an author point of view, don't you think, Greg? Of course, yeah. I mean, you're right there. All roads lead to Rome. And the question, we have about a minute and a half in this first hour, uh, half hour. Uh, we saw what happened in Paris. We saw what happened in San Bernardino, this orchestrated terrorism. Has anything been going on like that in Rome that we haven't heard about? We, we didn't have... Uh, uh, fortunately, lately, uh, terrorist attacks of this kind. But you remember very well when you were in Rome, we had uh, an Islamic terrorist attack in the early 80s. Exactly. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, it's not like this. Uh, probably we had this kind of attacks a lot earlier than the U.S. had. Um, so, in a way, the police forces are for maybe more prepared uh, because they had all that period of tension, which I think you lived even more than me, because I was very young, a kid at the time. You were a journalist in Rome in the in the years of the strategy of tension. Yeah, and I almost and, got blown up there and killed. To be honest with you, I'm lucky to be here. <laughs> Never which told. Which was that? Uh, it's which, when uh, it was near Piazza Barberini when they blew off an explosion uh, before Ronald Reagan came, and uh, uh, I don't know if you uh, remember that. Yeah, no, I mean, there were a lot of things that happened all under the, 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 this banner of strategy of tension, of course, that we, which was uh, piloted by people like Steve Pichnik. Mm -hmm. And uh, and now Steve Pichnik just uh, goes on the air tranquil, talks in America. But uh, let's remember that he's... Uh, um, Leo, he's let, me, in... let me just take this break right now. We'll come back in uh, three minutes yeah. with uh, Leo Zagami. Visit crossthborder.org. C R O S S cross the border dot org to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of the book. The rapture will be canceled. That's cross the border dot org. I know you all want answers, and believe me, so do I, and I'll do my best to get them. Despite Nicolas Cage's promise to do his best to get left behind rapture answers for us. 
don't hold your breath. Not everyone believes Left Behind is true prophecy. Some may even regard as conspiratorial the mainstream re-release of the Left Behind movie with actor Nicolas Cage portraying the main character as an attempt to further reinforce in the minds of all this perception of false prophecy in order to condition the masses for the play about to begin. If you want true Bible prophecy answers, get the book, The Rapture Will Be Cancelled. The author exposes the Latin rapture origin, the seven-year tribulation deception, true Bible revelation of Daniel's 70 weeks, the abomination of desolation, the restrainer, America in the revelation, the image of the beast, and the mark of the beast, and the truth about God's chosen people, and so much more about Bible prophecy. This book will shatter the left behind paradigm of future events. Get the book, The Rapture Will Be Canceled. Visit crosstheborder.org, C-R-O-S-S, crosstheborder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of the book, the rapture will be canceled. That's crosstheborder.org. Okay, we're back for the second half hour of the Investigative Journal. And remember, you can catch my show every evening from 6 p.m. to 7 p.m. FirstAmendmentRadio.com. You can also go to my long-running website. It's been there about, God knows, time flies, 11 years. ArcticBeacon.com. That's A-R-C-T-I-C-B-E-A-C-O-N. And if you're a real industrious, you can go back into my archives and get some of my old interviews with Leo and listen to those. To We're not going to waste time on Leo's background because uh, that would take the whole show. But just to tell you this, uh, I got involved with Leo because I thought he had interesting information regarding the subject I was talking about, the phrase that I coined, the Vatican-led New World Order. And... When I started talking, I found out so many things. And the one thing I've learned over the years, and Leo's helped me to understand this, is when you think you know something uh, and you think that you've got the corner on all of it, uh, you're, you're very sadly mistaken because the subject that we talk about here that Leo's written books about is very complex. There's layer upon layer of deception. And you will find sometimes that you have to be a man enough to admit when you were wrong and move on when you find out new information and that's what I I think that's the real lesson that anybody researching this subject has to learn that you are going to make mistakes because people who are writing about are deceivers they don't leave a trail that's very clear do they Leo yeah well <laughs> the problem is that sometimes you prefer to just accept your certainties because if you put yourself certain boundaries then you don't risk to fall into the unknown and the unknown sometimes it's uh, so powerful that uh, it can just put into discussion like you said yourself and change yourself completely so I also grown up a lot from how I was 10 years ago when we first met Greg I'm a very different person now because I understood uh, my mistakes. I understood not to trust certain people that uh, took advantage of the fact that I was openly coming on the internet giving all these secrets. You know, they were honest people like you that were treating the subject in a certain way and, and also gave me, uh, portray me in the right way uh, until, of course, even you got some problems into that situation. Uh, we know very well because yeah. we were surrounded by people that simply were jealous, wanted to jump on the bad wagon, fill up uh, uh, the, the whole internet with stories that uh, had to be from you know incredible and outrageous, uh, when instead uh, we started this whole adventure 10 years ago, as you know very well, with strictly stating uh, that there were some facts that we had to report uh, and that you, uh, you know, I was coming to you uh, with my confessions. It was, uh, the, the, I just started this little blog, and soon after, you remember, mm -hmm. uh, they, they arrived, they closed the blog, uh, the, 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 the police uh, and the intelligence in Norway, the PST threatened me openly. Um, this led then a couple of years later to even worse situation, the accusation of espionage and all kinds of things. So, I mean, we were definitely doing the right things if uh, all these people got so worried. Otherwise, they would not do it. Exactly. Exactly. And what I wanted to get at was uh, 
from your vantage point in Rome, uh, what do they have planned for the for America? Americans right now are under this constant fear of uh, ISIS terrorism. It's constantly on the news. What is there from your perspective? What do you think they have planned for us here? Well, we, we, we started to see what they have planned uh, clearly in front of the eyes, I think, of every American when the Pope uh, arrived in the U.S. recently in, uh, in September 2015. Um, this made basically uh, the whole of America uh, really witness the power that a man like this had by mobilizing whole cities, blocking everything, uh, being a god on earth basically, arriving into the United Nations, delivering his, uh, his uh, mondialist speech, uh, arriving inside the Congress, no? a double, a double session, joint session no? of Congress. And, and what happened there? I mean, he didn't mention once Jesus. Yeah. He mentioned only Moses. Mm -hmm. uh, because it's recognized by the free religions. This gives you the immediate idea. He celebrated a um, special mass, a ground zero, with all the representatives of other religions, but they were not really representative of other religions. They were actually trained uh, agents uh, of the, you know, of the worst kind, giving uh, their best performance. And and, 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 and and of course, uh, I have also proved that, uh, for example, the rabbi was from the Council of Foreign Relations, or the other guy was, you know, the Muslim guy was, I mean, uh, they were all kind of uh, put there in this setup, because this is the mondialist setup, the Vatican led New World Order, that, coin, that phrase you coined so long ago, uh, came to become really uh, visible to the eyes of everybody. And I think that now people in America know that this is not a joke, that the Pope is implementing the Mondialist plan, which is also the plan of the United Nations, uh, which uh, is a communistic plan. I mean, that Jesuit philosophy, which we talked about so much when we described the Jesuits, is really uh, making this bond complete, you know, with the Obama kind of uh, uh, communistic ways, his communistic Jesuitic ways, his great friends with Fidel Castro, uh, he, everything uh, basically ends up in a big communist charade. I mean, and the ones who really are opposing communism, you know, the crazy thing at this moment of time, are actually the ones who had communism and they were the first victims of communists, which are the Russians, who are instead have gone back to orthodoxy and Christianity. Um, <laughs> so there is... Uh, a clash here of, uh, of the whole civilization because the Jesuits are really pushing this uh, new age neo-theosophy uh, they have infiltrated theosophy and Madame Blavatsky the day she, she died the day after the Jesuits had already infiltrated theosophy and they made it into the religion of the new world order for the coming uh, their coming messiah the coming matreya they are trying to manifest the end of time. So this is unfortunately more and more visible. Everything that we uh, basically announced 10 years ago came into fruition. So, I mean, we shouldn't be wrong now, no, Greg, that we have it in front of us. I mean, uh, it's a... a uh, the Roman Catholic Jesuit University, for example, in uh, Winifield neighborhood in Philadelphia, which was the place where the Pope went, uh, is the place used as a training ground for the professionals called in by the CIA, the agency. This yeah. is uh, the opening, also chapter six of my uh, of my book, Confessions, Volume One, that describes how the Jesuits have a real and proper course course called the craft of intelligence at St. Joseph University in which they talk about uh, the following subjects, U.S. intelligence versus, you know, Al-Qaeda ISIS, then you have U.S. intelligence about China, the ultra-secret Israeli intelligence services, the CIA, all these things are taught by Jesuit, uh, and the code name for the Jesuit is uh, for the Jesuit is Doctor Joe's because Doctor Joe's is uh, connected to also the uh, the name of this university, uh, and, and so it's very interesting the way they camouflage themselves uh, with Saint Joe's becoming Doctor Joe's, 
and the, and the Jesuits have a course for the CIA operatives within the university, giving them the basis of the craft of intelligence, <laughs> meaning also uh, t- teaching them everything about the, 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 I mean, every single text. I have actually put a list of all the texts which uh, the Jesuits teach to their students, Intelligence and the Mirror by Bathurst, the Baron Breaking the Ring, the KGB Today, Body of Secrets of Bamford. There's a whole course that these Jesuits do in order to extract the CA. I mean, it's quite incredible, don't you think? Uh, yeah, that's interesting, and uh, I should tell Americans that it isn't just uh, in the past where they did this. They're actually doing it today. Quite one other question. How do you look at China now? What to, what uh, What's the I mean, Jesuit China, influence on, there? China is a, is a Jesuit place, a completely Jesuit. I mean, Andreotti, Andreotti, uh, wrote uh, one of his last books uh, dedicated to the greatest uh, Jesuit who went to China and who has, uh, you know, I mean, there is, uh, uh, I don't know if you know the connection with China and the Jesuits. Do you do, do you have it, uh, do you know a little bit about the Go history? ahead, yeah, that's why I asked you. Loyola, Go ahead, tell us. The first thing he did uh, after he founded the Jesuits was to immediately, the first thing, I mean, he just had founded the order after being arrested for five times by the Inquisition and then finally convincing the Pope that his order had to be founded, well, uh, what happened next is that uh, he creates this uh, uh, order based a bit on the Templar principles and so on, and he wanted to use these Jesuits as kind of merchants of light uh, with their knowledge arriving into the most powerful places on the planet, and one of the most powerful was, of course, uh, the Emperor, uh, the, the Empire of China, and they so and then Japan. Mm-hmm. And so that's why the Jesuits have really a long history in uh, in China and in Japan. And for that reason, I don't believe that China can be an enemy uh, at this point of a Jesuit pope. You have seen how different is the attitude from when we had Ratzinger. And China was always at war with the Vatican. Every day there was some kind of report, this, that, and all the other, at least here in Italy. Then maybe in America they're also interested about these kind of things. Mm-hmm. But um, there was uh, continuous reports because of the fact that uh, Ratzinger was not uh, uh, judged as being suitable uh, for, the, for the Chinese. They had to create their own church. They had to create their own bishop that they could trust. So there was a clash with the Vatican about this thing. So the Vatican nominated their own head, and China nominated their own uh, bishop, okay? Mm-hmm. With the arrival of Pope Francis, boom, it all this up. <laughs> so now he's got the he's connecting with the Chinese a little better, right? Well, I think that the next move of this pope uh, will be to uh, announce a visit in China, uh, because I think that uh, he has discussed this immediately after when he was on the plane coming back from the U.S. He uh, told the media on the plane that his wish was to go to China. After, uh, you remember that during those days when the Pope was there, there was also the head of China the, who arrived, the Prime Minister of China arrived to the U.S. for participating to the summit at the U.N. Mm-hmm. Well, here's, um, one, here's one question. I just wanted to get some in, uh, information if you have any on this. But I found it interesting that in a short period of time, the, the Jesuit general Black Pope resigns, the Pope resigns, and this is unprecedented, really. It very it happens very rarely. Whatever happened to Kolvenbach? You know Hans Kolvenbach, who resigned. And uh, what's and Ratzinger it's up? It's going to be next year, uh, Nicholas, that resigns because uh, actually this year they will uh, no next year, sorry, 2016, uh, they will uh, do the world gathering of the Jesuits, in which uh, Nicholas has already announced that he's going to resign. So at that point, once he resigns, we will have three black popes. Yeah, so what do you, have you heard anything about Kolvenbach, where he's at? Sure, well, uh, the last things I heard was uh, that uh, he, they used to call this the age of the two popes before, you know, you had the whole thing with Pope Francis coming in with Ratzinger, the normal pope, you know, so it's now, they kind of like picked up on a tendency, on an experiment started with the Jesuits, because the Jesuits had never resigned. Kolvenbach was the first one to resign. Right. 
but he was deemed uh, important for the plan that they were putting together in the Middle East to destabilize further and everything that happened until now. So Kovenbach has simply been much more involved into the Middle East than he has been involved in other affairs. Right, that's what I was it's, figuring. And and Ratzinger, people ask me, what's he doing now? Is he just uh, playing golf or what? What's he doing? <laughs> he plays, uh, like I say in my book, uh, I depict him like Liberace with his piano, <laughs> his poodles, and uh, he has then uh, Georg next to him. Uh, he's very camp. Yeah, because he did have that. Does he still he's sing? Very sick. He's very sick. Oh. He, he has leucemia. Leucemia. Leukemia. Le, 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 oh, leukemia. Le, oh, okay. Le, yeah. So he's uh, visibly more sick. Yesterday you could see it. Uh, if you if you put uh, the videos from yesterday at the opening of the um, holy door for the misericordia for the uh, year of the, the jubilee year, mm -hmm. uh, Ratzinger was visibly visibly sick. Uh, well, Leo, there's so much. Be, there's a... be even uh, that this guy has AIDS. Oh, okay. Well, we'll see. We'll see. Because I remember the last time we were talking about him, uh, there was a big scandal about his boyfriend who worked with him there in Rome, right? Absolutely. Uh, we basically we were the first ones who really pinpointed on this aspect and I came out with this information then you picked it up and amplified through the alternative media and it, it, it was really the subject of discussion in Rome uh, when I arrived into the foreign press that you know very well in Rome um, they were all talking about this uh, revelation and later on uh, when the Pope actually before he uh, left there was uh, information that came directly from the Vatican that they had found him at 2 o'clock at night uh, with uh, one of his, uh, I think, BMWs. Mm -hmm. He had uh, broken, the car had broken down, and basically they have found him with uh, this uh, young, uh, young boy, this uh, younger guy. Uh, not even, I think, his, uh, you know, like, uh, boyfriend, his official boyfriend is always Patrick Georg, I guess. Mm -hmm. But uh, um, this more young guy, and so I think that the Jesuits really use this uh, this uh, scandal, this particular scandal that could have come out if you know if the information was made public, because he immediately pushed this button, which immediately they arrived there and pick him up. You know, he has a special button, of course. <laughs> but uh, if this information went out, uh, I think uh, that they could have damaged them very much. So I think that was really the last, uh, you know, the, the, the actual probably motivation that made him go, the scandal that happened with this uh, young boy late at night. You know, one thing people would be interested in is we hear about this, the open immigration policies that are going on uh, yeah. in Italy, in other foreign countries. Uh, what's it like in Rome now? What, how has this immigration policy deteriorated the lifestyle there? They already completed the lifestyle. The Pope uh, theoretically wants everybody to welcome uh, with false promises the, the immigrants. Uh, they even, you know, say we will welcome the, in, in, the, in their churches and so on. And then we prove, uh, we prove. Uh, actually, some journalist friends of mine from Piazza Pulita, this it Italian TV show, went around pretending to be Syrian refugees in every church in Rome and couldn't find anybody actually willing to take them in. Mm -hmm. So the thing is that they make themselves the promoters of something that they actually don't practice themselves. Uh, the people are left, uh, basically, they're doing a lot of money with these centers for immigrants, the Vatican itself is actually corrupted and takes money because there is a huge amount of money that is poured into these centers from the state, from the European Union and so on. And certain priests and certain uh, you know people in the Vatican know that this is a way to make a lot of money. So uh, they, they, they really, there was a scandal last summer where the immigrants went out of one of these uh, centers and started to throw everything in the air and then wrote uh, on the on the pavement uh, outside of this center that the priest in question, which I know very well, uh, was actually uh, uh, like, a, they, they called them really rude words, I will not say now on the radio, but I mean, they insulted them very badly because they said, you are taking advantage of us. So this just gives you an idea of how the Vatican is taking uh, the situation in their hands to even make money with these refugees. I mean, it's really far out. 
And uh, life in Rome, how's it changed, Leo? I mean, I remember ten, when I was there in the 80s, uh, I felt very safe. You know, a lot of different people from all over the world, but uh, the influx of immigration, has it changed that city the way you live right now? Completely. There is not anymore uh, the city they used to be. You have to be very careful. Certain areas are actually completely off limits after a certain time of night. I can tell you from a friend of mine who works into the security business, I mean, he gets called by uh, maybe big companies or uh, owners of buildings that suddenly have their buildings, their uh, places of work occupied by immigrants who uh, are led by uh, sympathizers that, of course, uh, have a whole uh, uh, interest in doing this uh, and led them inside these buildings to actually make them occupy these buildings. And, and then there is uh, whole warfare going on in the middle of the night with these uh, drug dealers, these uh, security operators. There's a whole reality which the day, the time person in Rome himself even ignores Mm -hmm. uh, because it's so bad, the media doesn't really expose it. Uh, so you, but you have uh, definitely a very bad situation. It's, it's, it's better to live in the countryside, it's better to live outside, where I'm sure you can find a nice place, Greg, like mm -hmm. uh, it's in your dreams. But Rome is off limits because it's not the place it used to be. Yeah, and I'm, I'm sure the euro has changed the, the financial lifestyle there, huh? <laughs> The euro has changed, unfortunately, impoverished very much uh, this, uh, this, this country. When yeah, I was there, it was the lira. You know, when I was there, it was still the lira. Yeah, <laughs> yeah no, gradually more and more it got worse and worse. And now there is really a whole influx of poverty. And remember that Rome now, in the last few months, uh, saw also the resignation of its own mayor. So we don't even have a mayor anymore in Rome. There is actually a commissario, an inspector, uh, like a chief of the police who is in charge of the city. We don't have a mayor because he had to actually step down because of the scandals. Wow. So, and what, so uh, have you, uh, what kind of government do you, is, you know, the old saying here in America is Italy's government changes every year. Is no, that still no, going on? Now you have to understand that Italy is not anymore like in the days of the First Republic. In the days of the First Republic, meaning until 1993-94, since then there has been a constant alternation between the two parties that, in the end, are the same people. Uh, you know, but uh, one is the Democratic Party of Italy, uh, that is the ex-communist that then became the Ulivo, and then later on the other names and ended up in the end calling themselves Democrats. So they are exactly like the American Democrats. And the other one are the conservative ones that used to be with Berlusconi. But then now you have also the Cinque Stelle, which is another sort of uh, manipulated opposition, uh, which uh, tries to be on the side of the people and is led by this uh, comedian called Beppe Grillo, which I think you remember, used to be right. just a comedian, a famous comedian in Italy. But then uh, he became the creator of this important political reality. Uh, but they are not capable really of ruling anything because they don't uh, have the, the, the whole the real power is still controlled completely by the old president who is not officially even in charge who is uh, president Giorgio Napolitano who himself is member of some pow powerful transatlantic lodges American lodges and so on and uh, a very important connection with him and the Jesuits and Giorgio Napolitano, uh, he's uh, from the ex-Communist Party. As you remember, the Communist mm -hmm. Party was uh, a little bit strange in Italy because in Italy you had the, the famous Catto communism. You, had, you could be Catholic and communism. This is the, the crazy thing in Italy. I know that. So, I lived in a town that was communist at the time. Campagnano was run by, com you know, but it was no and, different, and I couldn't tell the difference. Sure. It was, you know. Yeah, and that's it. They created this thing called Catto communism that then filtered into the Democratic Party. So basically now the Democratic Party of today is a mix of Catto communists, all democristiani. You remember the Partito mm -hmm. Democristiano that ruled so much in Italy. And uh, so these people basically that are on top, uh, still from the old uh, school, some of them, but they have uh, this new uh, puppet uh, on the scene, which is this prime minister called Renzi, uh, who was not even elected. He was the mayor of Florence. Leo, let me, let me break in here. 
uh, we got only got a minute and a half, and I want to get some information out. Shoot. And then we will uh, – okay, I'm going to try to get Leo on once a week for a while to catch up on the last few years that we haven't talked together. And also, Leo, can they get your book in America, The Last Pope? Yes, on um, CCC Publishing, you can get it at Barnes & Noble even. Uh, you can go on each, in every Barnes & Noble in America and get it. But if you want to order it online, Amazon is a very good way of ordering it. At the moment, Illuminati Confessions Volume 1 is actually number one in the Freemasonry section. And uh, Pope Francis, the last Pope question mark, uh, had, has reached uh, uh, even the number one in church administration, which is kind <laughs> of an awkward chart to be in, but I guess an interesting one. It was very interesting the fact that my book, during the period, the, Pope, the one uh, dedicated to Pope Francis, during the period the Pope visited America, was actually alternating himself uh, in the Amazon chat, uh, in the religious section, uh, as number one or number two with the Pope uh, Francis book, uh, his actual book, you know, so it was kind of interesting. You okay, know? Leo, <laughs> listen, if you want to get to Leo's book, uh, Pope Francis, The Last Pope, go to the, go online, you can find it. Leo, we're all out of time, we'll have you on next week, okay, when our time permits. It's right? Yeah, thanks very much, Greg. Okay, thank you. Okay. Wait, okay. Just a second. Sure, sure. Do I have no. a... Do, no, just... No, no, no. We have another 20 minutes, yeah? No. No. Me. Let me, uh, you're listening to First Amendment Radio.com worldwide. Freedom is never free. We need your support today at First Amendment Radio.com. The program you are listening to is 100% sponsored by you, the listener, on this First Amendment Rights Media channel. You will notice that there are few commercials on this radio network. There's a good reason for that. Corporate advertising dollars come with strings that limit program content. So without your help, these programs cannot continue on Internet or our several affiliates. If you benefit by the educational law programs, we ask you to give. If you are admonished or nurtured by the Bible and ministry programs, we ask you to give. If some voice a cause that you are passionate about, we ask you to give. If you believe in any of these, we ask you to support them as you would a missionary on a continual basis, as if giving a tithe for Missionary Radio. These programs are not commercially viable and must be supported by those faithful to the cause of truth. Look for the button to sponsor your favorite programs at our Listen and Schedule pages on the Internet. Then, when you subscribe, we will send you the last quarterly MP3 CD of that program immediately and continue to do so with each new quarter. We will also give you unlimited archive access to all of our programs. We're asking you to give much less than a tithe so that you may also send support directly to a particular program host cause and anywhere else the spirit may lead you do all to the glory of our god and creator for his holy nation the only kingdom that will last forever thank you for listening since the beginning of time kings have sought it nations have fought for it it has been traded, it has been borrowed, it has been purchased, it has been stolen, there's a reason for it. To secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and to our posterity, invest with the security of gold and silver. Call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 1-800-375-4188 or visit DiscountGoldAndSilverTrading.net. Listen to Financial Survival with your host, Melody Cedarstrom, right here on FirstAmendmentRadio.com at 4 p.m. Eastern or 1 p.m. Pacific Time. Visit DiscountGoldAndSilverTrading.net or call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 1-800-375-4188. Toll free, 1-800-375-4188.